Well, the tribes are all on reservations. Now what? Well, what came next for the U.S. government and for a lot of, a lot of people in the United States was to embark on an effort to, quote, civilize the Indians, to, quote, Americanize them, which sounds strange, seeing as how, you know, they were Americans first. Anyhow, uh, the goal was to, um, to remove their old culture, remove their old culture and their attachment to it, so as to make them assimilate, so as to make them fit in to the broader American culture. And there were a lot of different ways to do that, but that was the end goal. In other words, to kill the Indian, to save the man, which uh, is an actual quote from an actual person, Captain Richard Henry Pratt. And we saw this photo of him earlier. This photo is from 1875. Captain Pratt there is at uh, Fort Marion in Florida, a prison where the Comanche and Kiowa uh, warriors who had been captured at the end of the Red River War were sent. And there he is with them. There's Lone Wolf standing right next to him. Well, uh, Captain Henry Pratt is going to be very, very influential in what comes next. Pratt, who eventually became a brigadier general, um, believed that education was the answer, and he got in touch with uh, Hampton Institute in Virginia, which had been established in 1868 as a, uh, as a trade school, uh, essentially, for African Americans, very similar to the, to the Tuskegee Institute um, of Booker T. Washington in Alabama. Anyway, he got in touch with them and uh, got them to agree to allow Native American students in as well. And when those Kiowa warriors were released from prison, he convinced 17 of them to agree to go and attend that school. And uh, from that point forward, for many years, Hampton Institute uh, had a, uh, an American Indian program and they had, uh, well, African-American and Native American students working there together. Uh, so that was 1878. Um, they accepted those, uh, those new students, and Pratt convinced the U.S. government to fund something like that um, on, a, on a federal level. And so Carlisle Indian School was established with Richard Henry Pratt as its director. It was established the following year in 1879. It was the first federally funded uh, Indian um, boarding school, essentially. These types of schools, Hampton and Carlisle and Haskell Indian Institute that uh, was established a few years later in Kansas, um, students went there to live, essentially. Usually, um, anywhere from uh, prepubescent to, to, to teenage uh, students. And initially, initially Pratt traveled uh, as early as 1878, before the Carlisle School actually opened. He traveled to, uh, to South Dakota and met with Red Cloud and Spotted Tail in 1878 to try to convince them uh, to send students to this new school. They couldn't be compelled to do so, but those two chiefs, uh, um, they, they bought into the plan and they encouraged uh, some of the uh, younger people, some of the young men on the reservation and boys, uh, encouraged their families to, to send them to this school. I think initially 30 or 40 of them. So the school was, was established and the goal was to teach the students a trade, either agricultural or mechanical, but also to teach them to stop being Indians. So they were forced to cut their hair. They were forced to dress like good Americans. Uh, they were forced to learn English if they didn't already speak it and were in fact forbidden 
to speak their native languages or practice their native customs while they were at these schools. Now, a lot of times when you took, uh, particularly when they started accepting students from different tribes and different reservations, uh, there would be epidemics uh, of illness that the uh, students were much more susceptible to than non-Indian students would have been. So a lot of these, uh, a lot of these boys and later uh, girls, as there were girl schools, and sometimes I think some schools had boys and girls, um, never went home again, uh, died and were buried in many cases at these schools. Now, as I said, attendance was not compulsory at that point. However, after the passing of the Dawes Act in 1887, it did become compulsory. And uh, then the situation was that the, uh, the government, the, the, uh, the reservation uh, agents uh, would essentially just decide what kids were going to be sent to these schools, whether their parents wanted them to or not. And they would be uh, harshly punished if they tried to uh, continue uh, practicing their own culture or speaking their own language. And uh, these schools, some of them, uh, continued well into the 20th century, and the practice of taking children away against the will of their parents and sending them to, to boarding schools, that didn't end until the 1970s. What Carlisle is best known for is its a football program. They fielded a college football team beginning in the uh, early to mid-1890s and uh, were one of the powerhouses of college football for the next 20 years. Um, you can see there on the right, uh, the guy in the back row with the necktie, he was their coach, not Native American. Uh, he was a guy that worked for, worked for the school. His name was Pop Warner. Maybe you've heard of him, right? That's what the uh, Little League version of football is, is still called. The, um, the biggest star of the team played um, in the early 19-teens. His name was Jim Thorpe. He was a halfback, and he was, uh, he was, a, he was from the Sock and Fox Nation in Oklahoma. He was uh, not only a uh, really good football player, he excelled at several sports. The team, um, really, I mean, they had some huge victories over the... Uh, um, the, the most powerful teams of the time, which as hard as it is to believe, were the Ivy League teams. They also had a big victory in 1912 over, uh, over Army, in which uh, over on the Army side, young Dwight David Eisenhower was knocked unconscious. Pop Warner told his players uh, that uh, he should just imagine all those Army players were from the 7th Cavalry, and this was their chance to, to get their revenge. Some of the things that the Carlisle Indians, that was the name of the team, and they could call themselves that because they were. Some of the things that they did that no one else had really done, uh, in many cases hadn't done at all, in other cases had never done effectively or to this degree, included the spiral forward pass, the fake handoff, uh, reverses, end arounds, flea flickers. By the way, my uh, uh, I wrote my senior thesis for my undergrad uh, history bachelor's degree on the Carlisle Indians. Jim Thorpe, uh, I said he was, he was good at several, um, several sports. He was uh, a gold medal, uh, multiple gold medal winner, winner in track and field in the Olympics. And uh, later he played professional football and professional baseball at uh, the same time. And in 1920, when uh, he was uh, uh, serving double duty as both the, uh, uh, the star player and the owner and the coach of his own team, he was one of the co-founders of what would become known as the NFL. In 1999, sports writers voted him the greatest American athlete of the 20th century. So that's, uh, that's their biggest claim to fame. However, there were a lot of other 
uh, people who would become uh, famous and, and uh, very influential, particularly in Native American um, activism, that passed through the halls of Carlisle. Here's one of them, Luther Standing Bear. He was Lakota, he was uh, Ogallala and Brule Lakota. Author, philosopher, and actor. Uh, he, uh, he did in fact become, uh, become a writer and he did uh, wrote several books about uh, Native American history and philosophy. And later in his life, um, during the era of silent films, uh, on up to the era of talking films, uh, he starred as, as a Native American frequently in several Hollywood movies. There's a picture of him there at the bottom when he was a student at Carlisle. And I wanted to share with you some of my favorite quotes from the writings of Luther Standing Bear. Here's one. Only to the white man was nature a uh, wilderness, and only to him was the land infested with wild animals and savage people. To us, it was tame. Earth was bountiful, and we were surrounded with the blessings of the great mystery. Not until the hairy man from the east came, and with brutal frenzy heaped injustices upon us and the families that we loved, was it wild for us. When the very animals of the forest began fleeing from his approach, then it was that for us the Wild West began. And another one. The old Lakota was wise. He knew that man's heart away from nature becomes hard. He knew that lack of respect for growing living things soon led to lack of respect for humans too. And uh, one more that I wanted to share. This is a good one and a short one. It is the mothers, not the warriors, who create a people and guide their destiny. These next two people that we're going to look at were not students at Carlisle Indian School, but uh, were Native Americans who worked there when they were younger and later in life were extremely, extremely well-known activists for uh, Native American causes and for uh, Native American rights. Zitkalasa, uh, who was a Yankton Dakota. She was, uh, she was born on the Yankton Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. And in the 1890s, late 1890s, she was the music teacher at Carlisle Indian School. Uh, later on, she co-wrote uh, an opera uh, about, uh, uh, about uh, Native American themes, and she wrote several books talking about her own struggle with identity, uh, with her own experience of being torn between her traditional uh, tribal identity and uh, the, uh, uh, the efforts to conform and to exist in the 20th century white world. Uh, she uh, actually wrote uh, quite a bit. She was the first extensively published female Native American author to, to write a lot of books about Native American culture. This other guy, Carlos Montezuma, he was not a Plains Indian. He was uh, a Yavapai and Apache from the, uh, the desert Southwest. He was, he was a doctor. He was the uh, official Carlisle Indian School physician. He was the second Native American to get an MD and become a medical doctor and uh, the first male to do so, the other being Dr. LaFleche, of course. Um, he actually um, had, uh, he and Zikala saw uh, a romantic relationship and even got engaged, but it was broken off. Uh, I think she broke it off around 1901 
because there was some uh, some disagreement about about their future together. Carlos Montezuma was uh, uh, had relocated to Chicago and started a medical practice there, and Zitkala Sa wanted to return to the Yankton Sioux Reservation uh, and help her people more directly. However, they remained friends, and and the two of them were very very actively involved uh, for the next couple of decades in Native American causes. In fact, they often worked closely with uh, this guy on, on the left, close friend of theirs, Charles Eastman, alias Ohiyasa, who is pictured here on the left in his uh, Western garb uh, and uh, right in his more traditional Dakota garb. He was of the Santee Dakota. He had been born in Minnesota in 1858 because when he was born, the Dakota had not yet been kicked out of the state of Minnesota uh, due to the uh, Dakota uprising. So uh, almost, uh, well, 18 years, his, his junior Zikala Sa was born on the reservation to which the Dakota were removed. Anyway, Eastman, was also a physician. He got his MD at uh, Boston University and became one of the most uh, prolific authors on uh, Sioux uh, ethnography uh, of the early 20th century. He was uh, the reservation doctor um, at the um, Pine Ridge Reservation. Uh, and he was, he was there when the uh, incident at Wounded Knee, which we're about to talk about, took place. Uh, it was while he was there that he met this lady, Elaine Goodall, who uh, was a white lady uh, from Massachusetts, uh, who was uh, a published poet and also an educator. Uh, she had, uh, in fact, uh, been a teacher at the Haskell Institute and uh, by the early, uh, by 1890, uh, she was uh, also working at the Pine Ridge Agency uh, in charge of the uh, education there. Uh, and the two of them worked closely together and, uh, and got married. Eastman founded, uh, he was very active in the YMCA. He was a uh, very dedicated Christian and of course, the Young Men Christians Association, he actually traveled around the country uh, establishing YMCA chapters on various reservations. And uh, that's, uh, that's how he had met uh, Carlos Montezuma and Zikala Sa. He came to uh, Carlisle Indian School in the late 1890s to set up a YMCA chapter there. Uh, so uh, all those folks worked very closely together, uh, among other things, forming the Society of American Indians and subsequent organizations that became uh, not only outspoken in, in writing about the culture and the issues of Native America, but also becoming very politically involved. Elaine Goodall and Charles Eastman were played, by the way, by Anna Paquin and Adam Beach in the 2007 movie version of Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. A major milestone on the road to Wounded Knee took place during the solar eclipse on January 1st, 1889, when a Paiute holy man named Wavoka had a vision. In his vision, he saw a much better world a world in which all the Paiute dead had been returned, returned to the world, and the white people taken out. Uh, it was a paradise, no illness, no death. And in order for it to come to pass, the vision told him the people needed to perform this ritual round dance called the ghost dance. So this is not, this was not a new phenomenon. This sort of vision had been uh, reported and promulgated many times over the uh, over a century uh, before that. 
starting with Neolan, the Delaware prophet in 1763, then Squatawa, the brother of Tecumseh, the Shawnee, in 1805, 1806, surrounding there. There was even a ghost dance movement among the Cherokees and others in the 18-teens. It, it was frequently the same kind of message. The message that the spirits have punished us by putting everything in the favor of the white people because we have not adhered, we as native people, have not adhered to the traditional ways and we have become too much like the white people. And if only we would return to our traditions that make us who we are. And if only we would show our reliance on the spirits, then everything would be turned back and we would once again have all the things that we have lost to the whites. Um, and we'd be rid of them too, which you got to admit, uh, after having looked at that map and how little land was still available to the uh, native peoples of North America, you could understand why this was a popular vision um, in 1889. And it was, it was very popular and spread throughout the uh, Paiute community and was carried by visitors to other Native American communities. It spread eastward to other tribes. The ghost dance movement spread from the Paiutes to the Lakotas on the Pine Ridge Reservation, brought there in 1890 by two Lakotas named Kicking Bear and Short Bull. And upon arrival among the Lakotas, there was a, there was a twist added, the ghost shirt, which was a, a special ritual ceremonial shirt that had to be worn during the dance, with the dance to, to, to be effective. And uh, at some point, someone, some say that it was a kicking bear, introduced the idea that these shirts would deflect bullets if need be. And before long, many of the Lakotas on the various reservations on the uh, former Great Sioux Reservation were participating in this dance, which caused some apprehension among the reservation administrators. Um, at this point, in 1890, uh, Suzette LaFleche and her husband, Thomas uh, Tibble, came to report on the phenomenon, to, to write about the ghost dance movement. <clears throat> the administrator of the Standing Rock Reservation was particularly concerned when it became known that Sitting Bull, who had, had uh, finished his touring with Buffalo Bill's Wild West show and rejoined his people, the Hunkpapa Lakota, on Standing Rock Reservation, that he was now also participating in this dance. That was enough to, uh, that was enough to also concern the U.S. Army and the white people in surrounding towns. They were all a little bit paranoid about this. After all, <clears throat> these are the Indians that had wiped out Custer. And now this is the guy that was in charge when they wiped out Custer. And they're beating drums and dancing. And traditionally, uh, the white folks knew from dime novels, whenever Indians start beating drums and dancing, they're about to go on the warpath. So it was believed that could happen at any time. The army called in. Nelson Miles, now a major general, which means he had his second star. And he was, in fact, the uh, uh, department commander, a job that had been held for about 15 years by Philip Sheridan. And then both uh, Alfred Terry and George Crook each had two years at the helm. And now it was uh, Miles's turn to be in the top spot. So he came uh, to the reservations along with, uh, well, his, his force included some members, uh, some companies from the 9th Cavalry, alias the Buffalo Soldiers, and also the 7th Cavalry, 
the outfit that uh, had been headed up by George Armstrong Custer and had lost between a third and almost a half of, uh, of their troops at the uh, Battle of the Little Bighorn, commanded by Sitting Bull. So, you know, what could go wrong? Fact is, that had been 14 years in the past, so uh, there weren't very many people still in the 7th Cavalry who had been there that day. In fact, a big bunch of the ones there that day died that day. But there were a few. There were a few of the older sergeants and uh, possibly even some of the uh, company commanders. But despite that, it still was the 7th Cavalry. So there was that esprit de corps, right? That, uh, that their regiment had been the one massacred by the Lakota Sioux. But the Indian agent at Standing Rock, James McLaughlin, was, was afraid to wait for the army to take action. He was fearful that Sitting Bull was planning to leave the reservation and leave the ghost dancers with him and go on the warpath and start a big uh, uprising and it could happen at any moment, uh, he thought. So he sent the Indian police to arrest Sitting Bull. So McLaughlin sent the reservation police to arrest Sitting Bull at about 5.30 in the morning on December 14, 1890. They showed up, woke him up, got him out of bed, told him he was under arrest, pulled him outside. He resisted, apparently quite loudly, uh, and his family was being pretty loud too. And they roused up all the neighbors. So all these Lakota come out and see what's going on. There were, by the way, about 40 Indian police. Well, uh, most of the people who were uh, living nearby were supporters of Sitting Bull and were outraged at what was happening. And they rushed to his defense. One of them fired a shot uh, and shot one of the Indian police. And immediately thereafter, um, the guy in charge of the Indian police uh, fired directly into the chest of Sitting Bull. Someone else shot him in the head. And, and he was dead. Within a few minutes, there were eight people dead on each side, including Sitting Bull and the guy who shot him first. So, um, wow, that could have gone better. Fearful of reprisal, uh, quite a large number, maybe as many as a couple of hundred, Hunkpapa Lakota left the Standing Rock Agency and fled to the Cheyenne River Agency, where they hoped to, uh, to get shelter and protection from Spotted Elk's band of Minikanju, Lakota. Spotted Elk, alias Bigfoot, the, uh, the brother of Touch the Clouds, the son of Lone Horn. Well, Spotted Elk, slash Bigfoot, decided that uh, that's not enough of them to be safe either. So he decided that they should all head to Pine Ridge and seek shelter with Red Cloud and, uh, and his band. And so they set off headed westward toward the Pine Ridge Agency, about 350 people. And on the way, they were encountered on December 28th by the 7th Cavalry. The 7th Cavalry was at that time commanded by Colonel James Forsyth. He had about 500 men with him, and they had four rapid-firing Hotchkiss mountain guns, which you can see three of them right there. Uh, the uh, Minikanju and uh, their Hunkpapa ally, allies that were traveling, there were 350 of them, 230 men and 120 women and children. They were, uh, they were surrounded by the cavalry troopers who told them to keep moving until they reached the creek, Wounded Knee Creek, and told them that once there, they were to make camp. So they did. Once they made camp, the 7th Cavalry troopers surrounded the camp um, and placed their guns. And then individual soldiers came out and ordered the, uh, the Lakotas to turn over all of their weapons. And so they were going down the line, taking, taking away guns. Uh, they got 38 
guns before they uh, reached an elderly guy named Black Coyote, who, when told to give up his gun, did not do so. Now, turns out this guy was uh, not only elderly, uh, he was uh, he was deaf. Also, he didn't speak English. So there are several levels on which he would not have known what was going on. Uh, he was protesting. I paid a lot for this gun, and he wasn't going to hand it over. So they grabbed it, and they're pulling it away from him. And there are uh, some versions that say the gun accidentally went off. Other versions that say one side or the other just started shooting. Now, if it was the Lakota side that started shooting, they only had a handful of guns left. They hadn't turned over yet. Um, so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that would have happened. No, uh, for whatever reason, or for no reason, the 7th Cavalry opened fire on the exposed and almost completely unarmed Lakotas. So the Lakota were able to put up some resistance. It was generally just a bloodbath with the Hotchkiss guns blazing and with uh, bullets being fired indiscriminately, um, regardless of age or sex. When the smoke had cleared, there were out of the 350 Lakotas who had been there, about 200 were dead, about 100 were wounded, some of them horribly, and about 50 were unharmed. Uh, that was uh, well, 51, four men and 47 women and children out of 120 women and children. Um, Colonel Miles, Jim, sorry. The Frozen Corpse of Spotted Elk, alias Bigfoot, Minikonju Chief, was found a short distance away. That corpse, along with roughly 200 others, were just shoved into a mass grave. Journalists Thomas Tibble and Suzette LaFleche were on hand, witnessed the whole thing, and, and wrote about it. But for the most part, particularly in the West, um, Americans were pretty happy to see that the 7th Cavalry had got their revenge for Custer's defeat. Um, the losses on the U.S. side were 25 killed. It's suspected that uh, at least some of those were accidentally shot by their own men because those Hotchkiss, basically uh, uh, mini cannon machine guns, uh, were blazing away. Um, nonetheless, 20 Congressional Medals of Honor were handed out to soldiers of the 7th Cavalry who were present that day. Um, since 2001, the National Congress of American Indians has been lobbying to have those medals revoked. It has come up for discussion on the floor, uh, the floor of the Senate, but uh, hasn't happened yet as of, as of this recording in 2020. Now, General, General Miles was not happy with either McLaughlin and his handling of Sitting Bull or of uh, Colonel Forsyth and his actions at Wounded Knee. Uh, in fact, he was very unhappy. He thought the whole thing was, as he described it to his, uh, to his wife in a letter, just an absolute horrible massacre. Uh, he believed it was totally and completely unfair and uncalled for. But uh, he was in the minority where, where white America was concerned. Uh, and uh, Forsyth wound up getting, getting a promotion. Now, just to demonstrate how people in the West felt about this, remember what I said before about proximity. Let's take a look at, uh, at one journalist. His name was L. Frank Baum.
There he is, L. Frank Baum. Looks like somebody's kindly uncle. Looks like the sort of person who would be a charming storyteller. If you've never heard of him, you have surely heard of his most famous work, the children's novel, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. That came out in uh, 1900, about a decade after the events we just discussed. Uh, in 1890, he was not writing children's books, no. He was the editor of a small town newspaper, the Aberdeen Daily Pioneer in Aberdeen, South Dakota. And here's an editorial he wrote about Sitting Bull on December 20th, 1890, six days after the, uh, after the death of Sitting Bull and eight days yet before the events that wounded me. Sitting Bull most renowned Sioux of modern history, is dead. He was not a chief, but without kingly lineage, he rose from a lowly position to the greatest medicine man of his time by virtue of his shrewdness and daring. He was an Indian with a white man's spirit of hatred and revenge for those who had wronged him and his. In his day, he saw his son and his tribe gradually driven from their possessions, forced to give up their old hunting grounds, and espouse the hard-working and uncongenial avocations of the whites. And these, his conquerors, were marked in their dealings with his people by selfishness, falsehood, and treachery. What wonder that his wild nature, untamed by years of subjection, should still revolt, what wonder that a fiery rage still burned within his breast, and that he should seek every opportunity of obtaining vengeance upon his natural enemies. The proud spirit of the original owners of these vast prairies, inherited through centuries of fierce and bloody wars for their possession, lingered last in the bosom of Sitting Bull. With his fall, the nobility of the redskin is extinguished, and what few are left are a pack of whining curs who lick the hand that smites them. The whites, by law of conquest, by justice of civilization, are masters of the American continent, and the best safety of the frontier settlements will be secured by the total annihilation of the few remaining Indians. Why not annihilation? Their glory has fled, their spirit broken, their manhood effaced, better that they die than live the miserable wretches that they are. History would forget these latter despicable beings and speak in later ages of the glory of these grand kings of forest and plain that Cooper loved to heroize. We cannot honestly regret their extermination, but we at least do justice to the manly characteristics possessed according to their license and education by the early Redskins of America. So, L. Frank Baum of South Dakota at this time is essentially saying, Indians used to be awesome, but the ones we're stuck with now suck. The ones that uh, uh, used to be so, so noble and daring that Cooper heroized James Fenimore Cooper uh, in the uh, leather stocking tales and Last of the Mohicans and so forth, that Sitting Bull was the last of those, and what we've got left are a bunch of whining curs, and they should just all be killed. Well, thank you very much, Wizard of Oz guy. Uh, you may ask yourself, though, this is his reaction to Sitting Bull's death. What would be his reaction to just people doing essentially what he called for them to do. Was that all bluff on his part? Let's see. From January 3rd, 1891, just a few days after the Wounded Knee Massacre, which, by the way, for the longest time was referred to as the Battle of Wounded Knee in official sources, but uh, we know it for what it was. Here's what he had to say. The peculiar policy of the government in employing so weak and vacillating a person as General Miles to look after the uneasy Indians has resulted in a terrible loss of blood to our soldiers, and a battle which at its best is a disgrace to the War Department. 
there's been plenty of time for prompt and decisive measures, the employment of which would have prevented this disaster. The pioneer has before declared that our only safety depends upon the complete extermination of the Indians. Having wronged them for centuries, we had better, in order to protect our civilization, follow it up by one more wrong and wipe these untamed and untamable creatures from the face of the earth. In this lies future safety for our settlers and the soldiers who are under incompetent commands. Otherwise, we may expect future years to be as full of trouble with the Redskins as those have been in the past. An Eastern contemporary with a grain of wisdom in its wit says that, quote, when the whites win a fight, it is a victory, and when the Indians win it, it is a massacre, end quote. So, to answer our question, he wasn't bluffing, he meant it. And so did a lot of other people in the West. They didn't get their wish completely. The, uh, the native tribes were not exterminated, but they had been, as, uh, as people like uh, Baum would have said, quote, by right of conquest, they had been conquered. The question now is, what happens next?